if you don't have your source of funds documentation laid out properly, it results in denial or extensive RFPs or notice of intent to deny, which usually causes significant delay in EB-5 applications. So my my advice to my clients and investors is put on put in all the hard work at the beginning of your petition, spend some time, weeks, designing the transaction, and then execute on the investment in the project. I think it's extremely important for investors to understand, especially in India. I've heard in smaller circles, there are Indian developers involved or there are smaller projects involved that'll give repayment guarantees to the investor directly. None of that is legally enforceable in a court. If the project refuses to pay you back, you can't go to court and say, hey, this guy promised to pay me because all EB-5 investment is at risk. The way to avoid that issue from happening is to make sure that if a project is sharing the financials, you study the financials in depth and you understand the relationship between that entity, the regional center and yourself as the investor. Whatever the corpus is, whatever the basis, whether it's a company, if you have your own business, USCIS wants to go back in time to understand that the source of funds used for the startup capital was legally sourced. So the story needs to start at the beginning. If it's your ordinary income, you need to go back in time, pull out your W-2s, tax returns, bank statements, and show that you were employed and you were indeed getting paid this much money. If it's capital gains, same thing. If you have equities that you've held on for 10 years, you need to show that they were acquired 10 years ago and you've maintained those. And gifts and inheritances, whoever you're inheriting from needs to establish that they legally acquired that asset that they're gifting to you. What I have insisted on is that any loans that you borrow from friends or family, you're paying an interest on it. You need to make sure that that friend and family discloses that interest as taxable income, because I've seen instances in which the government has asked for tax records of that person that's lending to you, and they wanna see that they're paying taxes. Secondly, even if it's tax-free in India, Indian tax returns have two components. One is the acknowledgement, which has all the numbers, finalized numbers, and the second is the worksheet. The worksheet is where you have the itemized layout of you know, what income you've earned and what percentage it's taxed at. Even if the gift you've received is at 0% tax, you wanna make sure that your accountant in India shows that income on computation and shows a 0% tax. So when you go to the embassy in Mumbai for an interview, you can show to the government, here's the registered gift deed and here's my tax return, which is registered with the Internal Revenue Service, which shows that there's a 0% tax on the gifts that I've received from my family members. A lot of investors in India have their own businesses that they draw ordinary income from. They'll draw salary from their own business. The government still wants to know how you got the money to start the business. They wanna see the business's financials. At that point, that business is no longer a third party. It is a related entity. Once it becomes, becomes a related entity, you need to explain the source of funds for that entity. Inheritances have two major issues, especially old inheritances. Clients need to make sure that their attorneys document how that asset was acquired by their great-great-grandparents or parents, even if they're not alive anymore. And the second is the tax consequences of that. A lot of the times we get RFE saying, have you paid taxes in India? And then my advice to attorneys as well as clients is attach a circular which shows that there are no gift taxes from immediate relatives in India. And if there are any tax consequences, it needs to be demonstrated in the computation of income. If you're borrowing from friends or companies, make sure your attorney has a conversation with the friend or the company explaining what it entails to lend this money to a third part, to, to a friend or to a petitioner they're going to have to go through the intrusive process of source of funds. And if that party is unwilling, you should not be using money from that party at all. It is very important to design the transaction with the attorney. Once the transaction is designed, we tend to create a checklist. Based on that checklist, then we collect documents. If you're working with an attorney who does not understand Indian documents, you will not know what other documents to provide in lieu of say form 16. If this client does not have a form 16, what else can he provide? If he does not have form 16A, what else can be provided? You know, If you don't have a birth certificate, you can provide a, a pen card or other card, which will have the name of the parents or the spouse. If you don't have a marriage certificate, you can provide an election commission card. All of that comes through practice and comes through dealing with these clients over and over again. And you need to account for deficiencies in documents and pivot by providing other documents that provide the same data. Every Indian client ever will say, I have tax returns. 
tax returns do not tell the government where you got the money from. All they say is that you've paid taxes on that income. The government wants an in-depth story, a forensic accounting of where your money came from. And if you do not provide that, you will get an RFE, NOID, or a denial. It's extremely, extremely important to keep the tax consequences in mind. If you have retained an attorney that does not understand tax, my advice is to go hire a tax lawyer. Uh, and if you're selling a property overseas and you're in the U.S. on an H-1B visa, India and the U.S. have a, a double taxation treaty, which means any property of yours that you sold in India, you're going to have to disclose the capital gains in India as well as in the U.S. The method for calculation is going to differ in both countries. India may say you owe taxes on 100K. U.S. may say you owe taxes on 200K. You're going to have to pay taxes in both countries because eventually the IRS is going to come and ask you questions and so is the USCIS. They're gonna come and ask whether you have complied with tax obligations in both countries. Very important to understand who acquired the property, your relationship with the acquirer of the property, whether there was a will in place, what the local country rules are, uh, and whether other heirs have waived their rights to these assets if it was interstate succession. I think what's very important that I wanna highlight is loans from Indian banks that are then remitted to the US for EB-5 investment purposes are illegal in India. You're not allowed to do that. I have seen cases where USCIS has approved the transaction. They end up going to Mumbai Embassy. Keep in mind, Mumbai Embassy is the only embassy in India that does that interviews EB-5 applicants. So they are subject matter experts in Indian law as well as EB-5 regs. Uh, they will tend to catch uh, this issue. They will flag the issue and say, hey, you violated local country rules thereby making your funds illegal and revoking your visa application. So very important to work with an attorney that understands the local rules as well as the U.S. rules. Extremely important that the repayment that is being made is discussed with your attorney in advance. The reason for that is you do not want to introduce new assets. The minute you introduce new assets for repayment, say you're using a property located in other area to repay this loan, your attorney is then going to have to go back and source how that asset was acquired. So best practice is to discuss in advance with your attorney what asset wealth are you going to be using to repay the mortgage. And ideally, you want to keep using that multifamily apartment in Mumbai so the attorney doesn't have to keep resourcing the asset that's paying for that loan. I, I think that my only recommendation to my clients is to focus on the track record, is to focus on um, the job creation requirement, and in this uncertain interest rate environment, to make sure that the entire capital stack is in place, the loan is in place, all the funds from the developer are in place uh, before investing in any project. We don't know how long India remains current or, or China remains current. We encourage our clients to file for adjustment of status uh, while India is current. Uh, and the benefit of that is the work permit is valid for two years. After that two year mark, even if India retrogresses, you can keep renewing that work permit until you get that conditional green card, which is a huge added benefit. The downside to it is the clients need to be extremely, extremely cautious in the project that they pick. They wanna make sure that they're not picking a project that hasn't started construction yet. I'm not saying that the project's gonna fail, it's just to protect them from the failure of project launching or not getting the requisite permits or not getting the requisite financing. It is always better for H-1B clients to go into mid-stage project that has already put in the jobs in place and that they know that there's no risk of default or the project not continuing. For Indian investors, we've seen a lot of rush in the rural TEA projects because of the priority processing and because of the 20% set aside. And there's also this faith that because this line is very new, it has just opened. Most projects on the market are high unemployment TEA. People are making assumptions that that's why most investors have ended up in high unemployment TEA projects. Rural is a better place to go by extrapolating that logic. And so people are going into rural for that 20% set aside to protect their kids from age out and to benefit from priority processing. What, what are some of the you know, most important things that you know, your clients have kind of conveyed to you of why why they decided to go with, with the Twin Lakes project. Yeah, I think the number one reason is because most of these clients are H-1B holders has been uh, the job creation aspect. The fact that this is not an early stage project, this is a mid-stage project. All of these guys already are going to get the jobs that are in place. They're gonna be allocated the jobs. 
the second thing I've heard is that they're very comfortable with the Atlanta metropolitan area, unlike some of the areas like where I live in, which is in Seattle uh, or San Francisco has experienced exponential growth and are kind of coming down now. Atlanta is experiencing uh, quite a bit of boom. The third thing is definitely Coulter. All these people recognize the Coulter brand. Uh, and I have a client who went in and looked at bankruptcy records to see if Coulter had filed any bankruptcies in the last 20 years or how they did in the 08 financial crisis. Um, and then just the home sale velocity. I mean, I think even in a high interest rate environment, clients have said that they feel comfortable with an aging US population investing in homes that are age restricted.